what I want this the talk to focus on is is how do you start your journey uh, into uh, into AI and, and 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 I think there's a lot of there's a lot of knowledge that we can get uh, from from the panelists up here. I hope to ask the right questions. Uh, one of the things that's always interested me in uh, you know in terms of I, I spoke about evolution um, in the industry um, and one of the things that we saw I think when when cloud became a thing um, I mentioned earlier there was a lot of skepticism uh, because it was a it was a it was a new concept uh, at the time and in fact you know it, it started gaining momentum at the time that we started building data centers and it was always one of the questions that people came and asked us was why are you guys building data centers how's this business going to work because everything's moving to the cloud um, and and so it was a it was a very misunderstood concept I think at uh, at the time um, and uh, a lot of people went into the cloud when it became that thing you know where, where, where you saw everybody else was doing it and and certain people were getting benefit from it a lot of people rushed in uh, into cloud without necessarily uh, doing it the right way or over speaking or you know again just that that misunderstanding um, and we, we we saw a lot of people make a couple of mistakes I think over there what's interesting to me and and I think I'll, I'll start this as a question is I don't necessarily see the same sort of skepticism um, in in AI you know and, 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 I, and I wonder if if the the mistakes that were made during the during the cloud boom um, have, have made people take a more measured measured approach. So I'm I'm going to leave that with the panelists. Each one of them can can give a, a comment on that. So I think hand over to you. Just the question. I mean, is is this more uh, more of a measured approach? Um, are people making the same sort of uh, same sort of calls, judgments, mistakes? Yeah. So thanks, Andrew. I mean, I think. Um, maybe a part of your question is, is there a hype cycle? Um, and you know, no doubt there, there is a hype cycle, but in my view, the, the hype is somewhat warranted. AI um, has proven itself over the last 10 years to be a game changer in, in many businesses. Um, and you might think of this as, now it's weird to say, but it's like traditional AI or traditional ML. You know, there's a, there's a hype cycle of generative AI right now. But um, given its track record, it's it's clearly not something like um, like blockchain, where 10 years ago we were seeing TED Talks where this was you know, the next big technology. And it was kind of like a, a problem looking for a, or a solution looking for a good problem. You know, even to a certain extent, things like robotics processing automation can be disappointing if you're just looking to implement something that is um, uh, is hyped about, but AI's track record is that um, uh, it's it's game changing where you've got any kind of uh, intelligent decision you're making, and you've got relevant data to that. And I, I would argue that's ninety nine percent of businesses. So where you know blockchain is looking for something like two percent of businesses, five percent of businesses. Almost every business is generating data and making intelligent decisions, and AI is proving to be invaluable in that environment. So, you know, almost everyone. Not to Thanks not to, to grow the hype even more. Yeah. But, uh, so, there is hype. No, I'm not going to kid anyone. Um, ChatGPT, to be fair, was the fastest adopted app in history. So, there's hype on that side. Um, However, having said that, it's not going to be appropriate for everyone. So finding the niche of what you want to automate, what you want to make efficient in your workflows, in most instances, probably won't be chat GPT related. So I think there's hype from a public perspective, but from an enterprise perspective, I think there's definitely a more managed approach. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit more cautious and a bit more calculated. Okay. And I think that's exactly, you know, that's what we're seeing you know, within the market. Okay, Jan, anything to add on that? No, just similar. I think AI has been with us for a while. So if I yeah. take us as a business, we're actually using AI. We've been using it for the last three years on the cooling side of things. Yes, it's not generative AI. Um, I think as an industry, we're more prepared for it. So I just take data centers, even though the numbers are astounding. 
um, as the hyperscalers started to hit and started to grow, that was, you know, something that we needed to deal with. I think uh, businesses are going to have probably a more measured approach to it, especially with cloud adoption. Um, you know, suddenly playing with models, what sits on premise, what sits off premise. So I think it's going to be a more measured approach and identifying the use cases. Okay. That's going to be super important, and that's the phase that yeah, we're in. That, is, that is one of the important things. So, Claudio, is there is there anything that you can share? I mean, implementations that you've seen, and I ask this off the back of, of of attending a number of, of AI conferences, and again, you know, trying to learn about things. And I've seen a number of, of presentations by enterprises uh, in the AI space and, and in in events that are AI specific, and. You know, I, I kind of look at, at, at a lot of what has been done and it's difficult for me to, I think, differentiate between what is what is just, you know, querying existing data versus, you know, when does it become uh, AI and what, what sort of things have you seen, I think, in the market that, that have been, you know, successful and, and, and what sort of process has that has that been? So we've got, you know, we've there's a number of use cases uh, per vertical, per industry. I'll give you one or two um, that sound really good, but more importantly, not all of them are generative AI, as you correctly said. Um, in addition to that, these are solving real problems within an organization. And this is how I keep going back to point number one, right? So point number one is make sure that you understand the use case and you're implementing the use case that is of value, and, of value to the business, right? Point number two, if you're, you know, if you're unsure of that, refer back to point number one. So we're back to the cycle. But I'll give you one or two. So a large uh, FMCG chain implemented computer vision within their warehouses. Um, and what they did in terms of efficiencies was they needed to get food to their customers quicker and on time in order to, to maximize their business. So what they did is with the computer vision is they actually monitored the conveyor belt system and it could automatically speed up or slow down based on, you know, people taking food off and packing it into into boxes, um, which automatically made the supply chain more efficient. But then, as they loaded that into the into the vehicles to transport that to the destinations, they had another one of our frameworks called QOpt, which is a route optimization program, um, and this could get them there more efficiently. So, apart from the fact that customers were now happy because customer service started to increase. Um, they all started to save costs on things like fuel, right? And time to market. So that was one instance. Another instance where we're doing something that is that is pretty impressive. These are all public, by the way, um, is for BMW. And this is quite a big one for us because it actually shows for me the power of what AI is, right? Um, and I spoke about digital twins earlier. And what they're doing is they're building an EV factory in Hungary. And they've actually created the fact they've created the full factory virtually, right? Um, and they're building it to simulate production of a certain amount of vehicles daily. So they want to know prior to building the factory, how many vehicles can this factory build? So through you know a full production simulation. So they're building the factory for a certain capacity of vehicles, but they're doing this all virtually. And once they've completed that, and when I say virtually, I mean, they, this is going down to really specific nuts and bolts um, on the supply chain, right? Um, and once they've done it in a virtual world, they're going to implement that in a physical world. So there again, it's implementing something with 100% certainty, it'll be a success. And this is, it's kind of for me where people need to see AI, um, because I think a lot of people are still stuck up in the generative AI warp and, th and there's definite use cases there. I mean, there are, but there is a, there is a bigger world out there. Um, and we need to understand what we want to make more efficient and what we, uh, you know, what's going to add value to the business. And, and I see that the, the Blackwell chipset was, was announced recently. Um, what are you seeing in, in, in terms of trends going forward? Um, you know, and, and. And in, in, in terms of efficiency and, and, and that sort of thing. So uh, when Blackwell was actually announced, um, <laughs> a Computex, the CEO, like, he's, like I said, actually announced Ruben as well, uh, which is June 2026. So it kind of gives a very comprehensive roadmap moving forward. But what is a common thread with every new reiteration of a GPU that comes out 
is that yes, there is more power um, consumption. But if you look at the performance increase that it gives you, okay, it way outstrips the amount that the power increases by. So I think with Blackwell, for instance, I think it's a 40% bump in performance with a 10% bump in power. So, you know, to quote what he says often, uh, the more you buy, the more you save. And it is true, apparently. Um, so that is, that's the one side of it. The other side of it is we are building GPUs, you know, we're not just building faster GPUs because guys are sort of sitting around the office, nothing to do. Um, th it's because society is pushing us to crunch models faster. People don't want to wait two weeks anymore. People don't even want to wait two days. They're down to hours now. And these models are getting bigger, so they require more performance capacity to be able to get there. Which is why when they do the comparison of Moore's Law, it's, it's a bit of an unfair comparison. Um, because if you look at the the way the GPUs have escalated in terms of performance, I mean, it, it really is stratospheric. So, yeah. And Jan, uh, we're talking about uh, efficiency. Um, and I think it has been mentioned, and you saw the slide earlier about the comparison between CPUs and GPUs. Certainly there is an increase in, uh, uh, in power requirements, but it is, you know, as, as has been said, a lot, a lot more efficient. I think we've seen this in, in the data center space. I remember we started off and I think our initial designs were something like 3.3 kilowatts per, per footprint. And we're now up to, as you said, 45 kilowatts. And, uh, you know, that's, that's growing. Mention, there's, there's been a lot of mention about the training model and the inference models. Um, where do you see that in, in the data centers in, or in the context of, of, of data centers, given the different power requirements between the two? It's a good question. So that, the, the training models, I think, ultimately are going to sit in places where there's cheap access to power. It doesn't have to be a highly connected facility like a Terraco. Um, there's a whole lot of crazy things going on in the world right now. So, uh, anecdotally, one of the large cloud providers, I think, launched a 100 megawatt training model in the US and turned it on at the same time, 100 megawatts, and basically landed up tripling the grid. Uh, and, that, and that's going to be the, the, cr the crucial thing around these training models is it's going to need huge amounts of power, yeah. but not all at the same time. So you're going to start landing, landing up having, having dedicated power plants specifically to those large training models. So I think that site that we're talking about with Amazon and the nuclear power plant, that's something like, you know, ideal, but you're going to have a closed loop power system specifically dedicated uh, you know, to the data center that's got these big training models. Because otherwise, just turning it on and off and putting it on a grid, there's there's no way any public utility is going to say you can have 100 megawatts on demand. Just t tell us when you need it. You know that, that's not going to make sense. The inference models, however, those are going to get close to the end user, and those will end up sitting in co-located facilities. You take banks, retailers, maybe it sits in the cloud. I think ultimately it lands up coming on premise, um, and yeah, you want quick decision making. So I think that's going to end up sitting closer to close to the end user. Yeah, and I've been, I, I think we heard a story the other day about uh, people putting training models on a ship, uh, you know, one of these one of these power generating ships, because uh, from a cost perspective, it, uh, it it was just more efficient. And and I think, you know, I've been, I've been thinking about this as training and inference. And um, in, in my world, where we, where we do the peering and the interconnection and that sort of thing, I think the difference for me, uh, if I had to, uh, make an analogy for, for what I know or what I do. It's it's the difference between having a movie studio in your living room versus streaming a movie on Netflix kind of thing. Um, you know, one is one is the actual production of it and the other is the the, the, the usage of that. Um, the in terms of in terms of what's being put into Terraco um, at the moment, uh, what, you know we've we've spoken about all the different types of, of cooling methodologies. Um, how, how, how is, I mean, at what scale of, is that happening with Interica and, and how do you see that going, going forward? So I could, I could tell everyone AI is here and AI is in South Africa. We have several deployments um, all around about the 45 kilowatt per rack level. So definitely happening in South Africa. Also, we're having crazy requests uh, and trying to sift through fact from fiction uh, and what's sustainable and what's not. So we've had, you know, in the last two months, we've probably had four requests for 
somewhere from seven to 15 megawatts of processing power. Um, a lot, obviously a large amount of that is training models. Um, and the idea is to work out, okay, which of those actually land up being real and staying because it's not the, the investment behind seven megawatts or 10 megawatts or 15 megawatts is massive. That's substation upgrades, five-year builds. Um, and the reason why we're getting the requests, I think is twofold. One is uh, Europe and the US is out of space. So there's a scramble happening to get data center space. Uh, and the second one is, uh, as South Africa, we're super accessible. So because we've got these cable systems on the east and west coast, and new ones getting built out, there's a new cables, uh, the new Google cable system going live as well soon, are highly accessible. So that starts making us as a potentially a friendlier destination. Also our power costs. So I mean, we all bitch and moan, Eskim and the power costs, but you compare that to Europe, actually still quite cost effective uh, from that perspective. Uh, maybe one last one, it's just what's happening in the crypto world. So as uh, I read an article on Bloomberg, but as obviously as it's getting harder and harder to, to make a profit out of mining Bitcoin, you're getting these huge, let's call them crypto data center companies that are being acquired by AI companies and they're all being repurposed for AI specifically for these training models. Uh, and I think this, you know, over the last two months has been probably three buyouts where these companies have all been taken, I don't know, 300, 400% premiums all to get access to the space yeah. and to get access to the power. Yeah, because that learning is a, is a sort of a short term, so it's not uh, not necessarily something that uh, uh, that you can build in. Um, I guess it takes us to the question of, I think AI as a as a service, as a sort of training thing, is, is that happening? You know, in other words, because it is such a short term thing, if, you know, is there a model where you can deploy or, or deploy all of the hardware and, and software that is required for that and then uh, sell it all as a, as a, as a short-term service? Absolutely. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, we've actually, to, to follow on from Jan's points, I mean, it's, um, we've had one or two partners, <laughs> so they're becoming video partners, and these were ex actually ex-crypto mining data centers where they had all of these GPUs and they've actually started to, to farm this out as AI as a service. So we've seen a lot of, you know, I want to call it uh, cloud service providers, sort of mid-tier, you know, sort of below the hyperscaler um, level that have created farms of GPUs uh, for GPU as a service, um, as well as AI as a service. So, so taking some of our foundation models, customizing them, and then monetizing that to customers as kind of like a cloud-based AI instance, if you will. Uh, where they, where people can come and run their environments, but I mean, I, to be fair, ultimately there is a bit of a crossover. So these are kind of really, I want to say, smallish models, where it doesn't make sense to put on-prem infrastructure or private cloud infrastructure into environments. Um, so these are, so these are people that are, you know, you need to make that cutover where the model starts to get a little bit bigger. You need to start looking at on-prem and i and i will tell you this i mean so one of the reasons for the event today which is really important for me is we've seen quite a big stumbling block with customers in europe and in the us that are deploying you know they'll just sort of run out and say okay well we'll just buy 200 of those uh, gpu servers um deliver them to my data center and we'll just install it it then arrives and they say oops we don't have the power, we don't have the cooling to keep this thing, you know, sort of contained. Um, and that, it really puts projects on hold. So, you know, IT and their strategy has one idea and facilities management data center is saying, hang on guys, that's not going to work. So you know, it is important. And I mean, obviously with Terraco being certified from an NVIDIA perspective in terms of the facility side of it, it makes a huge amount of sense from a private cloud implementation.